I'd like to call to order the December 19th, 2017 regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners. I invite you to stand if you choose while Commissioner Nash uh, leads us in the invocation and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. If you would, please bow your heads with me while you pray, if you so choose. Uh, people are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. Amen. If you would please uh, face the flag with me. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please call the roll. Commissioner Williams. Here. Commissioner Denning. Here. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Perrigan. Here. Mayor Wilkerson. Here. Do we have any awards or recognitions tonight, sir? Yes. Go right ahead. I'm, I'm proud on behalf of the city uh, to announce for the sixth uh, year in a row uh, we've received recognition from the Governor's Finance Officer Association for the presentation of our budget document. So, uh, and that goes a lot of kudos to uh, the budget team, especially for Aaron Ballou, who put it together and made it look good. So. We have good news twice on the budget, the message itself, as well as the presentation. So I'd just like to thank all the budget team, especially Aaron, for that work. Congratulations. Thank you all so much. Anyone else? Do you have any comments for us tonight, sir? I do. Um, there'll be a need for a late file. Second. Motion by me, second by Williams. Is there any discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. No, no Mayor, thank you. Approval of the minutes on the regular meeting of December 5th, 2017. So moved. Second. second. Motion by Perrigan, second by Denning. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. No. Wilkerson? Okay. Yes. First item is Municipal Order 2017-247. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Brandy R. Green to the, to the position of Housing Division Assistant in the Neighborhood and Community Services Department. Moved. Second. Uh, Ash second by Williams. Mr. Febo. Thank you, Mayor. We had an opening in the Housing Division uh, uh, NCS. We went out to a solicitation. We received 119 people who wanted to work for us. We reduced that down to 40s who, 42 met minimum qualification. We interviewed and tested uh, 10, and from the vetting, uh, Brandy Green was determined, in our opinion, to be the best candidate for the position. She has four years of experience in office manager, as well as one particular year in property management, which is helpful in this position. This is probably the position represents the first line of, of services we provide at NCS. I believe <coughs> Brandy's here. Right? Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Congratulations. Excited Thank for you. you. Hope I hope, well. hope you're uh, interested in doing working hard because I know who you work for there. So you're the taskmaster. Any comments or? It's not going to be easy for. That's that's the truth. There's some good people in the department, but mostly. Uh, Welcome. Please call. Our department heads. Uh, well, that's all I'm going to say. Please call the roll. Williams. Yes. Denning. Yes. Nash. Yes. Perrigan. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Thank you so much. Municipal Order 2017-248. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointments of Dan K. 
Bessel Meyer Jr., Alan A. Bush, Lauren P. Cecil, Austin B. Connor, Joshua L. Dennison, Kenneth W. James Jr., Dakota P. Justice, Corey W. Mahaney, and Shathan R. McCoy, and transfer of Roy D. Rogers to the position of firefighter in the fire department. Moved. Second. Ash, second by Williams. I had a, a Shathan E. McCoy. You said R. Is it E? Uh, I have R. R on the sheet, but it, do we have a correction? E. R on All right, we'll fix that. R Thank on you. the agenda, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I thought it'd be appropriate uh, to let the public know what it takes to be a fireman in our community and, and the process that these people uh, have to go through. So I asked Michael to put together a little uh, overview of the process and to uh, tell you a little bit about what we've done. Ribs, what does it take to be a firefighter? Uh, a lot of hard work. <laughs> uh, we started back in June uh, advertising the position, and here we are uh, ready to appoint uh, 10 individuals to start to work for us in January. Uh, both the Human Resources and Fire Department uh, work on an annual recruitment selection process. Uh, we started off with 243 applicants, of whom 152 actually showed up for our written test August 5th. That was 63%, which is just slightly below uh, where it was last year. Um, HR reviews the applications and their scores and then passed on a little over 100 to fire for review. Um, one thing we did a little differently this year, uh, the Chief Colson and his staff wanted to do is, in the past we've interviewed about 40 candidates, so when you have 100, uh, you potentially have left out a lot of good people. So what they did this time is actually went through and looked at the applicants who they had interviewed the previous year, those that they felt were good candidates. They went ahead and moved on to the interview, uh, looked at all the rest of the applicants, and then uh, we did quick interviews with 66 individuals. We actually had two teams interviewing, interviewing simultaneously, so that allowed them to look at around 76 candidates rather than 40. Uh, from that point, uh, 30 individuals received a full interview. Uh, members of the a workforce recruitment outreach committee, a citizen committee also sat in on those interviews. Uh, from that point, uh, we moved 18 candidates onto the polygraph and the psychological assessment. And from that, uh, now have an eligible list of 13 candidates. In addition to all that, the candidates had to go through the candidate physical agility test or CPAT, uh, which is a national uh, fitness test. We have to allow eight weeks uh, for candidates to prepare for and take that test. And then, of course, we also did a, the background checks. Uh, presently, the fire department has uh, two vacancies, uh, one due to retirement, but we have uh, another retirement at the end of this month, two more expected in January for a total of five. Uh, because we only recruit and have one recruit class a year, uh, we try to anticipate what openings we're going to have, and therefore the city manager authorized us to fill a few more positions, anticipating more retirements between now and the summer. Of the group we present to you, uh, at least six of them have competed at least twice. I believe at least three have applied with us at least four times. Uh, among the group, we've got three who are presently full-time firefighters with another uh, fire department in South Central Kentucky. We've got a couple who uh, are volunteers. We have three who are EMTs, and we have our police officer, Roy Rogers, who has uh, requested the transfer. Um, I believe at least nine of the candidates are here, if you all at least stand. And this is the class plus one more uh, who is not here that we're recommending for appointment or transfer. Good to see you here tonight. Do you have any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Congratulations to each other. And feel free to slip out if you want to, because we're about as interesting as watching paint dry up here most of the times. <laughs> Give yourself a lot of credit there. <laughs> that I'm that interesting, I got it. <laughs> Municipal Order 2017-249. Municipal Order approving the reappointments of Joanna Futrell mm -hmm. and Joanne Powell, and appointment of Barry Pruitt to the City of Bowling Green Board of Ethics. So moved. Second. Second by Williams. 
Uh, this is reappointment of two people who have completed their first term. Uh, I'm looking forward to their continued work and ask you to consider Barry Pruitt, a retired police officer currently working for Houchins Industries in their loss prevention area. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2017-250. Municipal order authorizing and accepting bid number 2018-09 for the Census Track 112 Exterior Property Improvements Program from Live the Dream Development Incorporated of Bowling Green, Kentucky in the amount of $250,000. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Wade. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we're trying to do some creative things with our neighborhood improvement program to take uh, uh, federal money and uh, to congregate in an area that can have an impact instead of dispersing them across various places in the community. One of the things we're doing is exterior improvements. Uh, it's a program we've done before, but we're again want to try to do it in Census Tract 12. I thought it'd be helpful for the public and for the commission to have Brent uh, Childress again give us a quick overview of what we're doing with this money and why. Thank you, Mr. DeFebo, Mayor and Commissioners for the opportunity. Uh, whenever we started the Neighborhood Improvements Program a few years ago, uh, I think I stood before you all and said, you know, we've got a lot to learn as we do this. One of the things that we learned was we need to rely more on partners. Uh, so we've had to change course on some of the things that we're doing and, and some of the investments that we're making in the community as we, as we roll out this Neighborhood Improvements Program to increase our timeliness and efficiency of making those investments. And tonight is, is, is one of those steps. Uh, tonight is looking for a partner that can come in, develop, administer, and manage a program uh, who we're calling the Exterior Improvements Program, which is very similar to what we did in 105.2 under the Private Property Improvements mm -hmm. Program. Uh, so to find that partner, we issued an RFP. Uh, we issued out a request and laid out kind of the guidelines, the rules of everything, and the only responsive uh, one that we received back was from Live the Dream, and they modeled a lot of the program off kind of what we had already done in the 105.2. Uh, so there's a, a whole lot of overlap uh, in that. The, there is one big change. Uh, we talked with them about this and felt like this was the best course of action based on what we learned of administering a similar program on 105.2. Uh, so in, whenever we're doing it now, we've completed about 75 projects out of about 117 properties that were approved. <coughs> the property owner was responsible for going out and finding the contractor paying for everything and then we would just reimburse and we felt like that that created an additional barrier that we didn't realize on the front end and as we moved into some other neighborhoods we felt like that barrier would be increased dramatically and make it more prohibitive for people to take advantage of the program to make these types of investments into their property and what we're looking at is investments can be very simple things it can be removing an old tree removing landscaping paving a driveway uh, the things that really make uh, the, the curb appeal improvements to a property, and we've seen tremendous benefits of this program in, in 105.2. So the, the one thing that is different from this is the Live the Dream will be having a pool of contractors that will go out and do work on this up to the $5,000 limit for those similar type projects. Uh, so that is a big change, but it takes the burden off the property owner to go out and find contractors. And one of the things we've seen uh, pretty steadily uh, lately with the growth and the uh, uh, pace of the construction industry here locally it's, it's hard to find contractors uh, to come in and do work so this way allows them to pull some of that to bring in a, a group of contractors to do that work so they they will be administering managing they're taking over full responsibility of the program uh, in the 112 area and as you've heard Nick and I say many times the 112 area is roughly Old Barron River Road to Old Morgantown Road and roughly Normal View west to the city limits of Bowling Green so this is just one of the programs that we're doing in neighborhood improvements uh, but we felt like it was an important investment to look at the the already built housing stock in the neighborhood to already look at the existing structures that are there and ways that we could make these types of improvements and live the dream is, is going to come alongside us as we as we make that uh, move into it and I'll entertain any questions or concerns anyone might have I'll answer your question so who is the first contact for the property owner where well, does that person go uh, step one 
step one. Step one is going to be for Live the Dream to finalize the application, market the program, receive applications. So this is all on them. So if, if people are in that 112 area, once they release the program, I mean, right now we're just awarding the agreement, we're awarding the contract. They'll have to roll this out, so that would still be, you know, a month or so before they get it going. It would be contact Live the Dream, which is at the Housing Authority, fill out an application, get everything rolling at that point. And, you know, the, the, their responsibility, in which we will assist them with in some, is that marketing outreach communication about uh, the program because you know it's like any other program there's a limited amount of funds available to do anything so there has to be some cutoff point in there and, uh, and you know making sure that you all are aware and, the, and that the citizens are aware that this program is available just in this geographic area that was one question that we got a lot of whenever we did it in 1052 well I live out in Briarwood well yeah but that's not in this area so you got to be in this area we're doing this one area at a time so we can focus our investments into each neighborhood as we move through this the city in the Bowling Green reinvestment area and landlords property managers can approach and request that's correct sir now they would be responsible for hiring their own contractors I think the way that Katie wrote the guidelines, it was homeowner occupied could use the pool of contractors, but landlords, I believe, are responsible for their own uh, securing of contractors to do the work. But yes, and there's a match ratio, just like what we used at 1052. Homeowners, so if you own and live in your property, you're eligible for 100%, no match, up to $5,000. Landlords are up eligible up to $5,000, but they must spend $6,250, which works out to be an 80-20 match. So they have to have some skin in the game. Businesses, which we don't expect to have very many of at all in this neighborhood just because there's a very limited number of businesses in this entire neighborhood area, <coughs> is a 50-50. So they have to spend 10000 to get 5000 and so what we've seen uh, in 105.2 is some maximize and get the whole 5,000. Some end up just with, you know, 4,800, 4,700, things like that. So it's hard to know what your exact number of properties is going to be uh, because you don't know that everybody's going to spend the full amount each time. And those things can roll over into another project. Great question. Based Always. Based on conversation that I had with you a couple of three weeks ago. I am a property owner or a property manager, and I approached about having some renovation work done. Mm -hmm. And the contractors, let me ask this, I guess, beforehand. How much work will your people, code enforcement, be involved in this contractual agreement would live the dream a uh, very little to none okay going back i requested a renovation i contact live the dream and they come out and meet me and that person from live the dream n n noticed that there may be a major code enforcement that you're not asking for that money for, are you asking for something else? Mm -hmm. Does the application process stop there? Where Live the Dream says, I think you've got a code violation here and you need to maybe see someone else, you, mm -hmm. about this violation before we can approach you about your requested mm -hmm. renovation. I won't say that it stops there. Uh, Live the Dream has the discretion of making recommendations, changes, approvals, denials to somebody's application. Uh, and, I, and I can speak from the experience that we had as doing our private property improvements program. Somebody might apply for something. <clears throat> Nick would go out, take the pictures, bring it back to our committee group, looking at it. We're going, yeah, we're not paying for that but we'll be glad to pay for this fence or this tree or this over here that is either a code enforcement violation or an eyesore. And then they'd go, okay, I'm good with that. So I won't say that the application just stops because that application could also be to remedy that code violation. And a lot of the times the things that we, that we saw that we were able to tackle weren't code violations, but they were things that were perceived to be code violations. 
And that's what has helped a lot in uh, just changing some of the appearance of the neighborhood. They weren't code violations, but people thought that they should be because they were not pretty, that sort of thing. It seems like a great opportunity to help disabled folks or uh, elderly or someone who just physically can't make, right. make a repair to their home. So I would hope that the communication of this gets to those people. And, and, and it's always hard whenever you're communicating across a broad swath of people in a, an entire geographic area. Uh, but that was one of the questions in the RFP that they had to respond to. What is your plan? How are you planning to communicate this? The other thing to think of is how are you going to plan to, what is your plan to communicate this to people who don't speak English in this neighborhood? Because we are aware that there's a high concentration of non-native speaking, non-native English speakers in this neighborhood. Uh, the 112 area is really kind of a fascinating uh, area once you spend some time in it and, and kind of go through and look at some of the information that's there. It's, and we've learned a lot about it. Even though we had a level of famili familiarity with it, we've still learned a lot about it. Uh, but we think it's an opportunity for people to increase uh, the, the kind of the value of the home. Uh, we've, we've picked this up from, from some other cities that have had really good success with this type of program. And just changing the outside appearance of the home just boosts everything. And if you look at it, whenever we start, we've had a couple of streets where we've had a lot of these hit, boom, 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 and it just changes the entire street then. It's not just one house, it's five houses, it's six houses. Uh, so uh, the right now, uh, and their request was for 250000 We have $500,000 budgeted for this program. Uh, so what we're looking for is to get started, kind of test everything, get through it, and then if everything's moving as we feel like it should, then we could allocate another $250,000 with y'all's permission uh, to keep this program moving forward so we could do more properties in the 112 area. Does Live the Dream get paid on a percentage of what is spent in the neighborhood or a flat fee? There is a flat budget part for their expenses because they are actively managing and administering this program. This is a this is a cost. This is time. Uh, Nick and I have been doing it for several months, and we recognize that we can't continue to do it if we want to do all these other things. So we have to have partners, and that's why we went with an RFP process, because we understood that this is a true contract relationship with somebody. Uh, we're, and this is what we'll be looking at as we move forward in this neighborhood improvements program, is more this RFP relationship, more contract relationship, as opposed to the grant relationship that we traditionally used. Uh, so we, you know, there was a defined service, there was a defined thing, and then there's a budget allocation in there for their cost. Financial. Yes. <clears throat> Wait. What's that? What way have you implemented financial accountability? The financial program? accountability is well, one, they have a limitation on the budget, so they can't uh, overcharge that. Uh, they have an, a, we give them an approximation of 40 houses, and that's based on $5,000 per house. So if you work out the budget, it's about $50,000 to run a $200,000 program. Uh, they have some hourly rates to set aside in there for the program administra administrator's time to run the program. Um, but until you they kind of get into it and figure it out, we're, we're giving them a little bit of flexibility to kind of figure that out, and then we can dial that in as we move into phase two of this, hopefully down the road. Alderone? Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2017-251. Municipal order approving a job development incentive program employee withholdings credit agreement with Carter Lumber Company. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. Mr. DeFebo. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to have uh, Jeff Meisel entertain this and explain it to the commission, please. This is these next two items on your agenda are uh, job development incentive agreements. Uh, Commissioner Nash and Commissioner Perigen, along with city manager, are on the job development incentive program committee. We met a few weeks ago. Uh, this first one is a Carter Lumber Company. They're proposing to uh, open up a facility in the Trans Park, 50 new jobs, uh, $10 million capital investment. Uh, this is a KB under the Kentucky Business Investment uh, Program under the state where the state provides 3% withholding credit and the city matches it with a 1% for 10 years. This incentive would be worth about 175000 to the company over that 10-year period. 
I'll go ahead and touch on the second one. It's uh, Kobe Aluminum Automotive Products. That one is an expansion uh, in the South Industrial Park at Kobe. Uh, they're proposing to create 129 new jobs. It's a $51.3 million capital investment. Uh, again, it's under the KBI program with the state where the city matches up to 1%. Uh, for 10 years, and that incentive would be worth approximately $518,000 to the company. I will mention um, on the Kobe, the city would capture approximately 609000 in new withholdings, and on the Carter Lumber, uh, the city's portion that they would re reap would be 206000 in, in the new job withholdings over the 10 years. So I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have any. Questions? Uh, I have one for Meredith, please. Meredith, in your many positions that you have uh, with these companies coming in, do we in their employment process encourage them to higher percentages based on the available workforce in the community? They only receive the credit from the state and from you guys on uh, jobs that they are sourced by people who live in Bowling Green, in the state of Kentucky, so they can't source from outside unless they're going to move here. Um, the state won't pay for somebody who lives across the state line. So minority individuals in the workforce area are be, will be encouraged to apply and the companies will be encouraged to support that effort? Companies are, they're gonna hire all the qualified people they can get right now. We have a huge shortage of people as you guys are well aware in our community. Um, we've actually got a couple of items next on the agenda to talk about that. Um, but they will hire all able-bodied people that are qualified for the positions that they have. They are going to hire a hundred people, and a hundred able-bodied people are one hundred whites. Are they going to hire them? Depends on who applies for the positions. I mean, the reality of right now that our manufacturers are facing is that there aren't enough people to fill the openings that we currently have, so they're currently stealing from each other. These two companies, since they're new, they'll be adding positions for first shift. So the reality is, is the people that are on second or third shift of the other companies will jump to these companies. And I understand it. And I think you know what my thoughts are and the interests are. Uh, any companies that come in our community here, I hope that there is a cross section of individuals working in all of our companies. Uh, I believe the state checks to see if they've got an equal opportunity em employer kind of designation or certification. Yeah. So I think the state would look out for that and, and manage that part. Will, it, will the state let us know or give us copies of those reports? They have to file reports with the state reporting who they hired, how many they've hired, and it's, it's yeah, pretty expensive. It's a lot closely, lot managed closer than it used to be. So. I understand that. My question is, will we, the city government of Bowling Green, be able to get a copy of that hiring process and the numbers they have? You can get copies of whatever they're reporting to the state. That's public record. We can get that. I'd like to request that that be a part of any and all future formats that we know as the elected leaders of this community who is being hired at these companies that the city of Bone Green is playing their part in financial wise uh, as to who's been hired because we are the ones that people call and ask, uh, is there any way we can get, or I can get some help on a job here, on a job there? And I realize 
based on what you, uh, and I mean, you know I'm not being critical of you. I understand, I understand. But if the person comes to me and they ask for one of those jobs and Mary just says, here's what we're looking for, I'm not going to send the guy out there that is not going to fit in. Yeah. But if there is a person that may fit in to that job and has got that background, I'm going to call you or one of your people that you designate. That's all I'm asking. Well, and we, I, we do the same thing for everybody else, police department, fire department, uh, and why shouldn't we do it? Or get the information from those that we're giving money to. One of the things I will tell you is, is in a few minutes we'll talk about the workforce coordinator program. And so that person on our team, um, they every week we call all of our targeted sector businesses. And so all of those that qualify for state and local incentives that you're providing a benefit to. Um, and we get from them their current weekly openings. Um, and then if there are any changes from previous weeks, if it's a new position, we get their job description. We provide that to 200 people in our workforce partner network every week. So all of those agencies, all of those entities are supposed to be referring every week to these companies to fill these openings. And if they say they referred someone, then we follow up with the company saying, did you, were they qualified? If they're qualified, did you interview them? If you interviewed them, were they hired? If they were not hired, why not? So we can go back to the referring entity and let them know why they weren't hired. So if it's a training issue, if it's an education issue, that can be remediated and the person would then be available for the next. So that's the system that we're building um, with that workforce coordinator program. I have no problem as long as uh, we're getting Bone Green, Warren County people jobs that meet the need. <coughs> Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2017-252. Municipal Order approving a job development incentive program employee withholdings credit agreement with Kobe Aluminum Automotive Products, LLC. So moved. Urgent second by Nash. We just heard the explanation on Kobe's. Any other comments or questions? Are there? I have one, Bruce. I, I, I think it's really important to note that after the 10 years, we get the 1.8 percent. So it's it's just a it's a short term thing. Plus, if the jobs don't come. Thank you. Yeah. If, if they don't realize what they say they're going to realize, then they don't get the incentive. Yeah. Comments. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Order 2017-253. Municipal order approving amended and restated workforce agreement between the City of Bowling Green and South Central Kentucky Works Incorporated. Second. Nash, second. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, flowing from Joe's questions, uh, I thought it'd be important for Meredith to come up and explain numbers seven and eight on your agenda. As we know, we have 6,000 uh, current openings. Uh, we've recreated the whole delivery process or are in the process of doing so, but it doesn't uh, immune the city from doing more. For the last two years, we've been uh, using uh, special funds to try to target a specific businesses in our community to help create uh, more jobs and to close that gap. So items seven and eight relate to that. Can I take your, what, you, what you're supposed to say? No, you're okay. fine. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, one, there are sort of two components here. Um, so as you guys are well aware, several years ago, we had a very sort of public workforce fight locally um, for the good of the community to make sure that the companies that we have here have the workforce that they need, um, that they are educated and trained to take those positions, and that we continue to be the fastest growing city in the state of Kentucky. Um, along those lines, um, obviously that requires a major cultural shift among several of our um, public workforce partners. And so we've had sort of a two-pronged approach. One was the workforce coordinator piece, which I talked about briefly just a minute ago, of having somebody that's constantly every week in their face getting the information and sharing it with them so there's no excuses. And then they, the referring partners have to report back every week how many they're referring. Um, we went from none 
to now on good weeks we have 70 to 80 referrals there's still a lot of work to do in that space because obviously you can't fill 6,000 open positions at the rate of 70 referrals a week um, the odds are all of those referrals aren't necessarily going to be qualified and get hired so we're still <coughs> working on that to build velocity in the system um, but I will um, one thank you for being um, sort of visionary on that process. We are touted by the state as the place in Kentucky that is doing workforce right. Um, and while we've had sort of minimal success by sort of our standards as a high um, growth uh, community, this is the model that the state is looking at for how to do this and how do we scale this. Um, on the SCK Works portion, what that funding is used for is the national consultant, um, Lori Strump with Strump & Associates that we bring in to help build that partner network. Um, so in the WIOA law, they're required, there are about 15 to 19 federal programs that funnel money into the workforce system. Locally, those programs are administered by about eight or nine different entities. And so bringing them all together, convening them on a regular basis to talk through how they best work together. One of the things we're also working on is building a brand new one-stop um, career center in Bowling Green. So for the first time ever, having a facility where they are all truly co-located, where a person can walk in as a job seeker, regardless of what program that they qualify for, they're all right there in one spot. They can get assessed, they can get trained, and they can get placed. And so Obviously, our focus is on how can we do this most quickly and most efficiently to ensure the success of our um, companies. The other component of the workforce coordinator piece is external relationships. Um, we've been working very closely with Fort Campbell, trying to rec recruit separating soldiers out of there. Um, we've worked very closely with Brent and with Leda Becker on your team, who have been amazing, helping us get in um, contact with the leadership of our international communities so that we can do a better job of assessing where are their barriers and how do we get them placed. And then we physically don't have the numbers to fill all the jobs, and so how do we do an external recruitment to get people to move to Bowling Green? Um, and that's something that we're pushing on the state as a whole to do a massive campaign as a state um, to get people to move to Kentucky and take the positions that we have available. Yes, sir. Maybe you could differentiate uh, the focus uh, of the two pots of money. Uh, that so with SEK Works, like I said, that's the national consultant focusing on the partnering, making sure that all those agencies that are supposed to work together truly are working together, and they're working together to maximize the benefit to our community. If you look at all those different programs, all those different pools of money, that's a $10 million impact on our community annually. Between all of them, they get $10 million. And so are we maximizing that money? And then the workforce coordinator is that internal piece to the chamber where we're actively contacting all of those targeted business companies, getting their direct need and pushing on the system to get those positions filled. Just for sake of disclosure, I'm on the, uh, the first board, the Sky Works board. Uh, so. Other comments or questions? Appreciate the hard work and it's a lot, lot to do and keep going. <laughs> Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Municipal Order 2017-254. Municipal Order approving amended and restated workforce coordinator agreement among the City of Bowling Green, Warren County, and Bowling Green Area Chamber of Commerce. So moved. Second. Second by Williams. Are there any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2017-255. Municipal Order authorizing and approving consent to sale of property located at 301 State Street and 415 East 3rd Avenue by the Housing Authority of Bowling Green. Moved. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a while back, uh, we owned 301 State Street, and as part of our economic development efforts in the downtown, we uh, gave that property to the Bowling Green Housing Authority for them to rehab it and to put it back into use. Uh, they have done so, and they're interested now in selling that. Part of our wraparound agreement requires the commission to give its consent uh, for permission to sell. If you look in your packet, uh, there is a letter from a man who's very passionate about continuing uh, cutting hair in downtown Bowling Green. So 
we wanted to honor that, and I put that in the packet. Uh, Katie Miller is here from the Bowling Green Housing Authority staff, has looked at this, and we support it. And uh, Brent's here if you have any questions. Katie, can you please come forward, please? Yes, sir. Raise your right hand or left. What is it being sold for? It's being sold for $160,000. That includes the building and the lot next to it. One that is paved behind the section there? Yes, sir. And there is a, the, that lot, there's an alley that kind of runs behind that um, parking lot, so it includes that lot as well. Tea room lot. Yes, sir. That's what I heard it was. It was. Before my time. Way before your yeah. time. You mm -hmm. even yes, know, sir. You wouldn't thought of. No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'll answer your question. I'll roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2017-256. Municipal Order authorizing the acceptance of 2018 grant funds from the Appalachia High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area through the Office of National Drug Control Policy in the amount of $36,000. Second. This is a yearly grant. As the commission knows, uh, we partner with, with the county to uh, run a, a drug task force. We get incented uh, through this program to help with the cost of overtime. Uh, we're here tonight to uh, hopefully accept $36,000 to help cover the overtime it takes to participate in the drug task force. Doug is here if you have any questions. I'll answer questions. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance BG 2017-58. Ordinance amending Code of Ordinances, Ordinance amending Chapter 2, Administration of the City of Bowling Green Code of Ordinances to repeal concealed carry requirements for the city, city facilities and language establishing hourly max, maximum hourly rates for outside legal services. So moved. Second. Motion by Williams, second by Perigen. Mr. Tabo, I think you're the sponsor. I, I can take care of the one housekeeping item, uh, which involves the uh, 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 giving me the authority to establish uh, and to hire outside counsel. We, as we talked about at the retreat, we wanted to uh, extend my authority to uh, apply a special counsel rate. The current rate was too low. We had to come to you all the time to amend it. So this would give me discretion. Hopefully I'll use good discretion. <coughs> And I'm responsible to, for, to you if I don't. So uh, we support this. Uh, the concealed carry, I'll defer to you, Mayor. Uh, sir? Are we giving you given the authority to negotiate uh, hourly legal fees? Is this what this is saying? Yes. And $500 an hour based on the area that we are pursuing you bring that back to us and we approve or deny it if it's, if it's a certain amount he has authority to spend a certain amount twenty five thousand correct it would which have is to be, what you've got now right yeah I, I would show i think this, this was a suggestion by the commission uh, i would show good discretion the current amount was this way too low and we couldn't do anything and it was uh, the current hourly weight rate right. was way too low. Right. The total amount remains the same. Yeah, twenty-five thousand is right. still there's nothing different. But you mm -hmm. could negotiate any hourly rate you wanted, based on what? Prior, provided it didn't exceed twenty-five thousand dollars for whatever whatever the issue was that was being right. dealt with. That issue would have been vetted with you already. It's more of a housekeeping item. I'm going to write that down, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, it still needs to follow the normal procurement rules that we already have. Second item was brought to us by city staff uh, about the uh, carry concealed issue under, maybe you can explain it better under Kentucky's constitution, what authority we have and do not have. Well, under Kentucky constitution and particularly with statutory, language now. There's a new statute adopted, Katie, three years ago, or time flies, where the state came in and General Assembly and adopted even more stringent language, basically, 
uh, that really tied the hands of cities and counties to regulate um, almost anything dealing with guns and weapons. Uh, if you may recall, even at that time, we went through our code of ordinances, I guess almost line by line, uh, to remove, I think one time we had language that you couldn't carry a weapon into the cemetery by code of ordinances. We had to remove that language. Uh, I think I uh, met with Brent Belcher, uh, and after reading a couple of his um, you know, signs in front of some of his buildings that had no weapon language, and remind him, by the way, you have to remove that language uh, because that conflicted with that statute. However, there's always, not always, but for several years, there's been one exception uh, that cities were authorized to do, uh, and that was to adopt uh, an ordinance that prohibited uh, the carrying of concealed weapons inside city buildings, as long as we designate those buildings on the, on the doors coming in with language that said no concealed weapons are allowed in this building. You know, that statute had very little teeth to it, there was no legal penalties to it. If somebody did violate it, uh, the only thing we could do was to ask them to leave the building. If they didn't leave the building, then we could call the police and maybe do something about trespass, but there were no legal um, criminal penalties for somebody violating that. Uh, and as a I think I've already talked to two or three of you, regardless of the concealed carry language, uh, you know, I think most people would agree, I think KLC does and most city attorneys do as well, that Regardless of that language, the city has no ability uh, to prohibit the carrying of open guns in any of its facilities or in any of its parks. Uh, in fact, we couldn't, we couldn't prevent concealed carry in parks. The only place we could uh, prohibit concealed carry was in buildings that were designated with writing. Um, but we could not prevent the open carry uh, of weapons in any city buildings at all. You know, I can't, Katie may remember, I can't remember how many years we've had this uh, ordinance on the books, quite a few, several years. Uh, I don't have any recollection that we've ever enforced this ordinance. You know, maybe one reason why if people are carrying something concealed, we don't see it. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and, and we've had questions, I've had questions in the past from some of the department heads about, you know, city employees. Um, and I've given them the same opinion that probably under existing law in Kentucky, city employees have the ability to carry open weapons um, inside city facilities, uh, inside fire trucks, uh, and just about any place else that they chose to carry uh, open weapons. Um, so given that, and I'll, I'll defer to the mayor since he's a sponsor of this, but again, I don't recall us ever enforcing this ordinance. Uh, I had, um, you know, Commissioner Nash asked me a day or so ago, was that mean then that, you know, people can carry in open guns to a city commission meeting? The answer is yes, they can and they have. Uh, not very often, but they have once or twice in, in my memory that I've been here, and there's not anything that we can do about that. Um, so, I mean, you, you know, given the fact that the ordinance has, you know, little penalties, little or no penalties, we've never enforced it to my knowledge. Uh, and uh, go back to what I said a minute ago, if we did see somebody with a concealed carry and we ask them to leave, they have every ability to say, you know, if it's under a jacket, just simply say, well, I'll take my jacket off uh, and, and I'll walk into the building with it open and we can't stop them. So. Well, we had a situation here a few years ago before we died. Joe Garman was sitting there in the third row, and Joe Garman has carried a gun all his life, even when he was in the crib as a baby, 45. Carried it all his life, all over Bowling Green. Everybody tried to get him in a spot where they could arrest him, and he was sitting right there in that third row on the right side, gun showing, and we asked him to, if he didn't mind, go outside, take it off. He did, came back in. So we're saying now that a person that has a concealed carry permit from the Commonwealth of Kentucky can wear their gun in here. Yes, if, if this passes, we would go through uh, the existing city buildings that have the language on the door, and we would take that language off the doors, that then would allow anyone uh, who is legally allowed to carry a concealed weapon uh, to carry now concealed weapons inside city buildings, and including- if that person uh, has a gun on that is not concealed, they still can come in. Yes, sir. Okay, next question. And I'm gonna ask this to Brent. Brent, uh, you have a lady that retired or transferred from police department to dog catcher. 
I'm a control officer, yes, sir. She transferred and started yesterday. That's true. Mm -hmm. Let's say that person has a concealed carry permit or one of the licenses that says this person can, can carry a gun anywhere in the world, and that state and those police agencies have to acknowledge okay. that gun. Could she do that and be a dog catcher and have her gun on? Yes. Good. Depending on how the weapon is secured, she would still be responsible. She is not required nor expected to carry a weapon uh, to be an animal control officer for the city of Bowling Green, nor is a code enforcement inspector or housing receptionist or a building inspector expected to or required to carry a firearm during the course of their business. But if she she would be responsible the type for it. Of dogs and stuff she has to encounter, she can have a gun on. If, if this ordinance passes, uh, she would have the ability to carry that firearm, in my understanding. She would have the ability to carry that firearm concealed if she had the proper license, because she is no longer a police officer, she, so she doesn't fall under the, the police officer uh, part of it. Uh, if she had the proper license, or they could open carry, which is already allowed uh, in Kentucky, uh, but they are not expected nor required to as part of their job for the city of Bullinger. Commissioner, take one step further. If this passes, she would be allowed to carry that concealed weapon inside the work building. She already has a legal authority to carry that concealed weapon outside. I mean, if she wanted to carry one while visiting homes uh, or looking or trying to find a dog or lose or anything else, she already has that authority. I like that. I like for her or him or whoever there to have that authority. One more clarification, too, if you don't mind. The, uh, this, this would not affect the Kentucky statute as it relates to the police department. The chief, I think the chief's here and I, the chief and I both have read that the statute. I think you gave us a reference. Uh, I think we are not either one real sure that that, that statute's applicable to police departments. It's, it's applicable to detention facilities, but our police department's not a detention facility. Um, but obviously, if, if people have concealed carry licenses, they will not be able to carry into locations that are prohibited by law from carrying them. You know, for example, uh, if one of our uh, animal wardens had a concealed carry, uh, they would not be allowed to carry it into the justice center or into the jail, or I guess schools have some requirements too. Um, and this is not just a, um, you know, we'll be talking about something else in a few minutes. This is not just an issue here. Other cities have looked at this um, I think Jason's not here, I think, right now, but I think we've heard from some of the fire departments, you know, particularly Louisville, Lexington, maybe I'm sure which one, uh, that they had uh, firefighters carrying weapons on fire trucks, and they actually put in the fire trucks, some of the fire trucks, um, I guess, little small gun block cabinets, or not really a cabinet, but a box. Um, so if they were uh, required to go into a school or someplace like that where they couldn't carry the gun, they were required to actually lock the gun up in that box when they went somewhere, they could not legally carry the weapon. What was the, what was the original question? Uh, I think um, the, the question was, will they still be able to carry in the police departments? And I think, that, I think Doug and I both think that they can carry in the police department. Because we think that statute is applicable to detention facilities and, and, and our jail, or our uh, police department is not a detention center. But we'll, we'll look at that one again, but our reading of that statute, that's, that's what we think. Well, in, in, and I think you'll find in most cases the people who are legally qualified under training and have been issued a concealed carry permit through the state of Kentucky, you probably don't have to worry much about those people anyway. And I'm not sure I'm worried about the police department because other people there have guns too. Yeah. <laughs> Comments or questions? Yes, sir. So the, qu the question is not whether or not somebody can bring a gun into city buildings. That's already established that if, as of today, if nothing changed, you could carry a firearm into a city building provided it was open carried. Yes, sir. The decision that we're making tonight is whether or not we prefer somebody to open carry or conceal carry and allow that to go on. Well, I think the question for you tonight is, right now we have uh, an, an ordinance that prohibits the concealed carry 
uh, into designated buildings that have been designated that you cannot carry into. I think the question for you tonight is, do you want to continue that ordinance prohibition about allowing people to carry concealed weapons into designated uh, buildings? I, know, I don't know how many times I've been asked the question, probably the last five years, that, well, we got a complaint at uh, a Little League ball game that somebody was there with a, uh, with, with a gun, concealed or open either one. You know, can't we stop that? And my answer always has been no. Concealed or open either one. Really not the same issue as, as this, but, you know, I think a lot of people are surprised that people can carry either concealed or open weapons into a lot of places here uh, in, in Kentucky, including parks uh, and, and during ball events and everything else. I think the only issue is here is, uh, does the city still want to keep the language that we have in the code of ordinances now uh, that prohibits the carrying of concealed weapons in certain buildings? But you, uh, back to your first question, uh, we have no ability to prevent anybody from carrying an open gun uh, into this building, city annex, public works building, or, or any other city building. It's interesting to me that the Kentucky legislature is who uh, uh, created this ability to, to, to carry in this way. And, and do you know where you can't carry a concealed or an open carry weapon? In, in in those chambers in, where? in, in the Kentucky State House oh. so they're, they're very comfortable with putting local legislators uh, who have a great deal more contact one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the very public that we're elected to serve uh, okay with putting those legislators in a position where they have to confront people in a room like this uh, with a firearm, but those same Kentucky legislators see fit to ensure that they don't have to encounter the same things. Uh, a, a few years ago when I was, uh, when I had the privilege of serving on the, the city commission, uh, we were taking considerable steps here at City Hall to ensure the safety of employees. Uh, when I was uh, when I was off the commission for four years, there was a great deal of work that took place in this very building on the second floor uh, to ensure that somebody couldn't go over a counter after somebody who, was, who, who they were upset with. It seems to fly in the face of the discussion that we were having then that we're now going to allow people to come into the building and, and have a gun on them and, and we don't know it. Uh, I realize that the, I, I understand and, and I, I can't dispute the argument that if somebody wants to carry a gun on them, they're probably going to carry a gun on them and that a sign isn't going to stop them from doing so. Uh, it, it seems to me to be an issue about uh, encouragement or agreement uh, to, to allow that to take place. Uh, in, in, in our public buildings, we have a lot of really heated discussions or conversations where people have considerable disagreement. And I think the idea that we're sending a message to somebody that you can secretly carry a gun in to a building is, is sending uh, the, the wrong message. Uh, I, it would be my preference that uh, uh, that they openly carry their weapon. At least then we're able to easily identify those people who are going to possess the greatest threat. Uh, if only a few years ago we were worried about somebody climbing over a counter and physically assaulting someone, to a few years later we're not concerned about somebody hiding a gun in their jacket that can shoot uh, somebody, they don't have to climb over the counter anymore. They, they can just shoot them from one side of the counter to the other. If they so choose, just seems to, to fly in the face of, of protection of not only ourselves as legislators, but our responsibility to protect city employees. Uh, you can't carry a weapon in a federal court facility. You can't carry a weapon in a United States post office. You can't carry a weapon at a ranger station or a visitor center in a national or state park. And you can't carry a weapon at a national cemetery or on an aircraft. 
but we're going to allow people to carry a weapon into a room where we discuss hotly debated issues like the fairness ordinance. That just doesn't seem to, to, to me to, to, to be acting in the best interest of, of those that we serve and those who work for the city who we have a responsibility to protect. I don't have anything else unless somebody has questions for me. And I am certainly the one that proposed the security system we got now. And you are exactly right. I'll have to propose another one where we put steel doors up, I guess, and nobody can see in and no one can see out. But uh, I thought it was a pretty good idea at the time. Uh, but. Can we table this and let's think a while? First reading is that. Well, he's thinking, mask, an additional question. Why these two items were couched together? Because on one item, I'm on, on the ordinance related to the legal fees, I'm in support. Related to concealed carry, I'm not. They seem like wildly different issues to me. I understand that they most they, they both fall under the same chapter, and and maybe that's why it was couched together. But it, it, be, it was commissioner just because we're doing chapter two. It would just be my preference that because they're such different issues, that they be uncouched if that is a word from one another. Do we have to vote on it tonight? Yeah, but it doesn't count. You don't have to vote on it. If you want to propose uh, to put it on the table, then we would have a vote on it. I need to think a while on it because I raised, I had criticism for suggesting that we put buzzers and locks on doors. Uh, Wes wasn't here. Were you here then, Wes? So I can't blame you. I was, I, I'm going to vote no on it tonight. I want to think about it because I thought when I made the motion at that particular time, it was an excellent motion. I took the heat for it for the $80,000, and I was thinking out, thinking for the employees who sat behind these desks, and at that time, a person could walk through the front door, walk right straight out of the back door, and all around in the back parking lot, no one may have even noticed the person coming through the building. Second of all, that same person could walk into Katie's office, two offices back from the entrance here, city manager's office, Kim's office, and do the same thing by walking up these steps here, going into offices over here on the right. And I'm not going to back down from having done that. It was right. I took the heat for it. No one's been hurt. Uh, Comments or questions? Well, the only thing that, that I'd say, voting yes or no on the issue is not going to change the fact that state law says that you can openly carry. That's correct. And, so, I, and I have no problem with that. So, you know, it's, people can do that now. And the only ones who are actually violating the law of any kind are people who don't have a concealed carry permit. They're carrying illegally to begin with. And all you can do then is ask them to leave. It's the only recourse. All roll. Yes. And the first vote, of course, doesn't count. Williams? Yes. Denning? No. Nash? No. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2017-257. Municipal Order approving the purchase of 750 Pearl Street from Marjorie F. Ayers and authorizing the mayor and other authorized city officials to execute the deed and all other necessary documents. So moved. Second. <laughs> by Denning, second by Nash. I believe this was the item that we talked about last at the public On the roll of the board, ready to we, go. Uh, took uh, his request and your approval and, and put it here tonight. 
One, one, uh, I do want to have one update though. The day after we did this, Mr. Ayers contacted me and provided documentation uh, that he did have a real estate uh, person uh, helping him sell this uh, and there was a real estate commission fee. So he asked if we could up this by 10% from 6,100 to 6,710. And given you all's discussion two weeks ago, I didn't see a problem with that. So that's what the deed is now for 6,710. Please, please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Denning? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. William Wilkerson? Yes. And the late file is a first reading of Ordinance BG 2017-59. Ordinance annexing property by consent. Ordinance annexing 38.21 acres of property located at 0 Moorhead Road in Greystone Subdivision, presently owned by Greystone Properties Incorporated, with said territory being contiguous to existing city limits. So moved. Second. Urgent second by Williams. I'm going to have Brent, uh, if we, with your uh, acquiescence, have Brent uh, Childers explain this to the commission. Is that okay? Brent Childers. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Uh, Mayor and Commissioner, it's a pleasure to be back before you again. Um, tonight's annexation, uh, while simple, has a lot of complexities to it based on timing. Uh, so that's uh, for the desire for the late file uh, and some other changes in schedule to, to keep this moving forward. So currently what you have before you is the annexation of a single track of property, 38.21 acres, that is currently being developed into phase 16 or a portion of this property is being currently developed into phase 16 of Greystone subdivision. Uh, Greystone subdivision phases one through 15 are all located within the city limits of Bowling Green. This track of land that adjoins it and will be the next phase is currently not located in the city limits of Bowling Green. There is a binding element uh, as part of this that required the developer to seek annexation before recording of the plat. Now the, the terminology used there is very important. Uh, this came up last week. Uh, we got the consent form drafted, sent to the developer, signed and returned. Rob started the, his work on drawing everything that you have before you. Uh, should look something like this, showing the 38.21 acres as one single track of property. The r reason I draw influence to the word seek is once the plat is recorded, that single track of property that is 38.21 acres turns into somewhere in the neighborhood of, I haven't counted all the lots, but I'm going to estimate around 60 lots that will then that can then be sold because they are lots of record, because they are platted lots. So in an effort to make this annexation as simple as possible, uh, we wanted to go ahead and annex a single track of property as opposed to going and tracking down the property owners of 60 lots uh, once this plat is recorded. Uh, which we assume would be a combination of home builders uh, with then having the issue related to of uh, having all of them say yes I agree and not having one street in or every other house in or whatever uh, that's why we were asking to go ahead and move this forward get this going so while it is still a single track of property get it annexed get it into the city limits of Bowling Green and then it can be parceled out into a about 50 to 60 lots uh, to be built on. Uh, so I'll, I'll entertain any questions. Gene, you got anything to add? Uh, just the only other thing requiring, I guess, even more particular hurry, we understand that the developer of the subdivision uh, is intending to start selling lots in, as in the next few days. So that, that's what's causing one of the, uh, I guess, rushes to get this done. Because as Ben said, we don't want to be dealing with multiple um, property owners out there and required consents and everything else. We thought we need to get done all in one swoop while it's owned by one person. So it's our, our it's the intent tonight that if this were to pass that we would have a second reading on this when? Tomorrow at 3.30. Tomorrow at 3.30. The special uh, call notice went out this afternoon. just want to ensure that the public was aware of that. It, yes. Comments or questions? Williams? Yes. Henning? Yes. Ash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Williams? Greg Wilkerson? Yes. Sorry. What, do you want me to vote again? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The day. next item we have is a work session regarding uh, panhandling, begging, charitable, and political solicitation. 
If I can give an intro, uh, at our last retreat, there was some discussion uh, by the commission uh, about this the emergent issue in our community, which is complicated by uh, federal uh, and legal precedent. Uh, Gene has been working with Amy and others to uh, put together what could be a, a solution to this problem here, and we thought it'd be important to have a work session to go over those, uh, those items. Gene? I'm trying to move as quickly as I can, but I know everybody uh, needs to go ahead and get out, and I'm not used to sitting, standing here, so maybe a little bit different for me as well. But uh, as Kevin said, right now we have um, two separate ordinances that deal with solicitations, specifically panhandling type of solicitations. Um, the draft I've done will, will do away with both of those and combine this into one, um, uh, one new subchapter in Chapter 9, uh, dealing with um, not just panhandling, but to make this maybe more legally secure, we'll pick up all forms of uh, solicitation, including political, charitable, and everything else. I think that's where most of the case law now is coming on, um, just like the um, case we talked to you about, about signs, is if you want to pass legal muster, you need to make this applicable to all types of solicitation, because if you, you, know, if you have to listen to what the person is asking to know if it's illegal or not, probably most of the courts are gonna say your ordinance is illegal as well too. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, most of the draft, and I'll give credit where it's due, most of the draft document came from uh, a draft uh, ordinance that was prepared by someone on behalf of the International Municipal Lawyers Association. Mm -hmm. They had a conference a few weeks ago and, and this uh, draft ordinance was discussed. They actually had a panel on it. Uh, this one was discussed. I've made some changes in that, in, in the model ordinance, but a lot of this came from that, uh, from that model ordinance. You know, I'm sure you don't really care, but this is, you know, talking about the kind of guns too, talking about a um, hotly contested issue, just Google. Um, go out and Google panhandling and, and see, uh, you know, how many thousands of hits you get immediately about cities adopting ordinances, cities amending ordinances. Uh, I think a lot of cities are now facing the same issue that we're facing. Lexington's um, ordinance got struck down by U.S. federal court a, a few months ago. So a lot of cities are now dealing with this to try to come up with some language they think will, uh, will pass that. Um, as said, Mingo, the one I've drafted picks up not just panhandling, uh, but picks up all forms of solicitation, charitable and, and political as well. One thing that we did do, um, you know, always before we had a, an, an aggressive one, aggressive panhandling, we kept that language. I think the definitions changed a little bit. We'll go over that in a little bit more detail. Uh, but we basically said aggressive panhandling is going to be illegal anywhere and everywhere um, in, in the city of Bowling Green. On the other hand of that, if it's not aggressive panhandling, then under our definition, basically it's passive uh, panhandling or passive solicitation. Um, and you know, obviously I think everybody now, most courts now agree that uh, solicitation panhandling is a constitutional First Amendment right. Um, so we are going to, we got language the ordinance of recognizing, acknowledging the right, uh, the First Amendment right of people to solicit, but we're trying to at least in passive solicitation, we're saying, okay, Passive solicitation will be okay, but we're gonna put some conditions on where you can do that as well too. And we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. Wanna make sure everybody's aware that this does not address door-to-door -door solicitation of people's houses. We've already got that covered under other things with our transient uh, business licenses and stuff like this. So this is not intended to handle that. We've already got that covered someplace else. Um, one thing, uh, Commissioner Nash at one time mentioned a permitting process, and I'll talk more in detail about it, but I did put one in, and, and we'll get to it. I try to make it as maybe as unintrusive uh, as, as possible, uh, again, with the hope that if challenged, that it will be uh, upheld too, and we'll talk again more details uh, about that as well too, but I did put in a permitting process. Um, kind of my last note before we get to this is a reminder that this is a draft ordinance only. This is something I've put together. Um, any comments, suggestions, concerns that the Board of Commissioners has, you know, I'll be glad to uh, go back and try to answer your questions if you got them or go back and make changes uh, if people think we need to make changes in it. You know, again, this is just kind of like my work product right now and open to any comments that, uh, uh, that you guys may have. All right. Like I said, the first section in uh, 941 deals with the definitions. Um, again, the first one is aggressive. Um, soliciting for charitable or political purposes, begging or panhandling. And these are kind of, uh, this page and next 
list about seven or eight things that, that we, under this ordinance, that we will classify as aggressive panhandling or aggressive solicitation. Probably need to keep using the word solicitation since it's gonna pick up more than just panhandling. Um, but again, confronting someone in a way that causes a reasonable person to fear bodily harm. Um, accosting or approaching or speaking in such a manner to cause a reasonable person to fear imminent body harm. Touching someone without their consent. Uh, using obscene or abusive language uh, while attempting to panhandle or solicit. Uh, forcing one another by continuing to solicit in close proximity. Um, you, particularly after you've got a negative response, somebody comes up, you say, no, I'm not interested. They continue to stand in your way, continue to, uh, um, to demand money or ask for money or do whatever else type of solicitation they're trying to do. Again, acting with the intent to intimidate someone to give them money or other conduct that a reasonable person uh, would have regarded as threatening or intimidating in order to solicit a uh, contribution or donation. So and when we get to it, you know, that definition of aggressive panhandling, any of those type of actions are gonna be prohibited, period. You know, if it's aggressive panhandling, that's gonna be uh, a violation of this ordinance and, and uh, subject to the penalties, whatever we decide those penalties may be. The second part of the definitions, we're gonna talk about a couple areas. We'll talk about areas with heightened personal security and we'll talk about a couple more. When we get to the next part where we're gonna say, okay, you can do passive, Passive solicitation is basically anything that's not aggressive. You know, anything that's, that's not prohibited, you will be allowed to do. But we're also going to say, but you can do that only in certain areas, or maybe reverse, there are certain areas that you cannot do passive solicitation in as well. You can't do aggressive any place. Passive, there are certain locations that we're going to say you can't do too. Uh, first one is areas with heightened personal security concerns within 20 feet of a public parking garage. 20 feet of a public uh, bus stop, a public transit entrance, 20 feet of access to building entrances, public events, venues, public accommodations, commercial businesses, again, where a person would have a reasonable or justified concern for their security. Um, and again, kind of a catch-all, uh, any other uh, place for kind of which congestion where a reasonable person um, would justify fear for their personal security due to congestion or close proximity to others. You know, that one's a little bit open-ended, um, but again, like parades, some of the other events that we have a lot of people congregated together where you may not feel comfortable with somebody trying to solicit, um, you know, it's going to fall under that catch-all. A second area when we get to passive where they cannot do passive solicitation uh, is areas with heightened personal uh, privacy concerns. Again, within 20 feet of an automatic teller machine, I'm not sure anybody wants somebody standing behind them while you're taking money out of the uh, um, uh, out of the uh, bank machines. I mean, I'm pretty bad even driving up to one. You know, a lot of times I don't feel real comfortable when I have somebody come in real close behind me in one of those. Uh, but we said again, within 20 feet of a, of a teller machine, uh, within 20 feet of a sidewalk cafe while the cafe is open, uh, within 20 feet of any school building or, or school grounds when the school's in session, uh, again, 20 feet of an entrance to any public restroom, uh, or on any private property when the person asks you to leave. Uh, and you uh, and you fail to leave, that can be picked up, up under uh, personal privacy concerns as well too. The third one uh, area that we're saying even passive uh, solicitation that we cannot do is areas with heightened public safety concerns. Um, this one's a little bit different from uh, from the model ordinance. Uh, that one, the model ordinance actually specified uh, some particular intersections. Uh, I thought I didn't want to do that because I'm not sure you know, how am I ever gonna identify which intersections are safer than others? I'm not sure any intersection is safe um, when people are moving around. Uh, if you're like me, uh, you know, every time a light turns green now, I'll wait like two or three seconds <laughs> to look left and right to make sure nobody's coming, uh, to make sure somebody's not running a red light to start with. So I'm not sure which intersections we'd ever be able to designate, oh, this one's okay, this one's not. Uh, so in the draft I did, I didn't make that distinction. Uh, basically said it includes the traffic or travel lane of any public streets or highways uh, open to vehicular traffic within the city uh, and the medians. You know, we have some intersections that have medians and I don't think we want people standing out in the median soliciting. Uh, so we put that in as well too. Um, next couple of these we'll go through real quick. We, we are defined passive panhandling or begging charitable stuff. That's basically anything that's not aggressive. Uh, either holding up a sign, verbally asking for money, uh, as long as you're not falling into aggressive uh, panhandling or aggressive solicitation, uh, then you're gonna be passive and that's where it is. Um, Question on you, back one slide. 
It'll include the traffic or travel lane. Um, does that include any of the right of way? Because what you generally see is somebody standing with a sign and then they run out into traffic and then run back in there. And that's I think if they run into a traffic, then they violate this. Uh, now, I do not pick up sidewalks or the other things. If you notice this, this is the traveled portion of them. I'm not talking about sidewalks. I'm talking about standing on the side of the road. I think where I've gotten the most complaints in the last few months is standing there at the off-ramp on I-65, uh, which is there, you know, clearly right there by the guardrail. In my mind, that's part of the travel lane. I don't know that that's specific I think a couple of things. I, mean, I, I can define this, maybe go further. Clearly, I do not want to include sidewalks because right. I think sidewalks are clearly open to solicitation, so I didn't want to go uh, quite that far. Uh, I know we've had issues, and not really issues, but questions in the past uh, about the green areas of rights away, uh, even with union activities and stuff like that, about our ability to, to prevent people from, I guess, doing First Amendment things in the untraveled portions. I will tell you, my, my draft here basically says the traveled portions. Go back to your thing, though. Even if they're standing there, they can't get any type of solicitation or donation unless they run into a traffic lane to get it. So if they run into a traffic lane to get it, then they violate this ordinance. Uh, but them simply being there, probably under this language, it does not. But I can look into that to try to expand it. Uh, I guess the question is, you know, how far to expand? I still, I guess, I could put it in and expand it to the right of way, maybe not including the sidewalks. There's a lot of times sidewalks are in the right of ways too. But I guess I could go if you if, if there's some interest in doing that. I could expand it to any portion of the right of way, you know, with the exception of sidewalks, perhaps. I could do that. But again, you go back to your question. Even if they're standing there. They can't get anything unless they actually go into the traveled portion. Of course, they're still standing there. That's not true because they could, they, the traffic could be queued up on the open road. They could be on the berm, so to speak, and lean into a window. Without I still think they did that. That would violate what I have now because they're still, they're still taking it from someone in the traveled portion. Take it from someone. Yes, yes. But I can, maybe I have no problem. I can look into maybe expanding that area a little wider. Gutters, uh, shoulders. I mean, I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I would look at the traffic manual and come up with all the various terms that are used and see if we can include those as well. Well, that'd be certainly, I, I can look, certainly look into doing that. With the exception, like I said, I do want to not include sidewalk because that's always been such a traditional First Amendment area. And most of our sidewalks are in the right way. So I'll come up with a, Broader, let, yes, sir, lesser, in fact, but I'll, I'll do that, Mayor. Okay. Um, again, the definition of charitable basically is just asking for, uh, for anything, including selling things, something for less than its, uh, um, you know, for more than its value. Or people want to clearly understand that they're, they're paying for something more than it's worth. But, again, that's just, just the definition of, of soliciting. But again, 9402 is where we come back in and say, you know, we go back to our eight things you can't do to be aggressive. Uh, this one says that no person shall engage in aggressive solicitation uh, for charitable political purposes, begging or panhandling uh, at any time or any location in the city. So if it's aggressive, it's just prohibited. But now we get into passive. You know, if I used the first couple of paragraphs, and, and maybe I didn't need to, but I put in the first couple of paragraphs to say, you know, acknowledgement and findings by the Board of Commissioners that you recognize the First Amendment rights of people to solicit. Um, followed by the second one, though, but highways and streets really aren't a place for this um, because of safety concerns, people, like you said, running in and out of traffic. Um, you know, the purpose of highways is to drive cars off and on. Um, it's, it's not for people to run out and, and get things from occupants of the car. But these are just kind of findings that, that I put in the ordinance as well, too. Again, the traffic of travel lanes and those medians are not designed for, not appropriate location for anything other than travel. Um, and then kind of the last finding that even though we may have prohibited certain places for passive, there's still lots of other places in, in the city that people can. This doesn't prevent people from soliciting everywhere. There's still gonna be lots of places that, uh, that they can. And I just put this language in kind of acknowledging the finding that uh, from the board that there are lots of places out there. Um, again, 9403, uh, passive panhandling, begging, charitable and political solicitation is prohibited in areas defined uh, as those with personal uh, security concerns that we defined. 
in areas with heightened personal privacy concerns that we defined. The second one goes in, talks about the, um, uh, the safety issues that's prohibited there. Uh, I do want to note, if you didn't pick it up at the end, uh, which are also prohibited by both the solicitor and the occupant. So I put language in here that if somebody doesn't comply with this, that the violation can be against not only the person who solicits that whatever they want for the person in the car, but the person in the car given it will also be in violation of this ordinance as well. Because this is a two-way street. They won't do it if people give or don't give. So at least this language right now, again, open to comments from y'all or suggestions, but the language right now that giving and receiving will both be a violation of this ordinance. And then 9404 is the permit. Again, I'm trying to make it fairly uh, unobtrusive if I could. Um, I know one of the things we talked about was some of the people are in this for business. So I, I kind of took that to, to heart uh, and, and said kind of the same thing that, well, if you're in for a business, then we probably need to permit you. If you truly are somebody traveling through the town and you've heard them like me, I don't know how many times I've been approached, you know, my car broke down, I'm out of gas, can you give me money? You know, if somebody truly does happen like that and they're here for a day doing it, it's probably unreasonable to expect them to come in and get a permit if they are here for a day or so and they truly are um, in need of something so they can, you know, fix their car or whatever, get gas and get out of town. Um, so I came up with the five days. It basically says that if you're going to engage in passive panhandling or solicitation uh, in the public for a period of more than five days a year, then you've got to go to the police department and get a permit. Uh, I didn't put a whole lot of stuff in a permit. I didn't put any requirements that they do a criminal history background um, because I felt a little bit uncomfortable that, well, just because you have a criminal record doesn't mean that you can't solicit like everybody else does. So I didn't put that in, but again, a lot of stuff's open to, to whatever you guys may want to. I also didn't put a fee in uh, with the idea that um, you know, a fee might be challenged because if you are truly needy, uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to make you pay for a permit uh, when, when you truly are needy. Yes, sir. How do we enforce five days? How do we know if an individual has been here an hour or five days? I, I thought that as well, and that won't be an easy thing, but I think um, the only thing I could thought of when I did this was police officers making their rounds, noticing people um, that I know this person's been here seven days ago, you know, that probably it's going to be the police officers who, who are going to be seeing these people on a routine basis. And what I likened it to when I thought about that uh, was the requirement if I move here from Tennessee, I got to change my license tags, that the police officers noticing there may be a car here, continue with Tennessee tags, and finally making a connection, you've got to get your tags changed. But I, I thought about that question as well, Commissioner, about, but the only thing I can think of, I think it would have to be up to police officers who are out on the street, who, who see these people, who probably recognize these people, uh, they finally catch on that, you know, gosh, this person's been here seven or eight days, I'm gonna check to see if they got a permit. But even if the person, but if the person doesn't have a permit, I, I like your thinking, so that please don't assume this as a personal attack or, or an attack on the ordinance. Even if the person doesn't have a permit and the police officer were to say, hey, you've been here for seven days, and that person says, no, I haven't, there's really no way to dispute that. Well, I we still have think three the police, police officers in the room. I, I don't know if any of them would want to weigh into that, but I mean, I just, if, and, and two on the board, it, it, I don't know how we get into the, away from the he said, she said, no, I wasn't here, yes, I was, no, you weren't. Uh, but I think that's the same issue of police officers. Well, I think that may be the same issue that police officers face on a lot of things about, well, the white was green, no, it was red. You know, it's, well, I saw it green, no, it was, green, it was red. Uh, but I still think, and we got the sheep behind me, but, you know, I think if, uh, you know, I think that officer will still be able to go into district court uh, and say, you know, I worked this date, this date, this date, this date. You know, I saw this person this date, this date, this date, this date. Um, but, I, but, again, the five days something I came up with just to, you know, maybe make it more business oriented, but I also did think of that concern about how they'd be able to do that. But I think police officers um, would still be able to, you know, these people out there on a daily basis, driving the same streets over and over, are gonna be able to recognize, you know, the same person from one day to the next to the next. 
I have no doubt that the police yeah. officer would recognize them. I don't mean that. It would be my preference that it's that it's zero days, and that is it. It makes it more of a cut and dry issue. You either have a permit or you don't, and if you don't, you need to you need to go obtain one. If I come back again and you're here, then you're in violation of the ordinance. Yeah, I have would, no I have no objections. Now follow y'all's lead on that. I just try to make with the idea that if you're here more than five days. It's more of a business for you right. than being someone maybe truly needy here for a day or so. Can I ask a question on that note? I know I'm kind of coming in from using. Um, does that mean that when we are campaigning and we hold a sign up that we need to go down to the police station and get a permit? No, because when you're, um, that question is also asked of me, when you're standing on the sidewalk just holding up a sign, um, you're, you know, unless you're within 20 feet of an entrance to a TV, uh, ATM machine, you know, unless you're in one of those areas uh, that you can't solicit, then you're going to be fine. Just like um, you know, probably 99% of all sidewalk areas here in town are not going to be applicable to this unless it falls within one of those areas of personal security or personal safety. So if you're standing on the corner of uh, um, like, Cemetery Road, yeah, that's the that, yeah, I don't think any of those are going to fall within the... Kind of there goes spot. our medians. Gene, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's not... Worry about me, worry about e. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think any of those areas are going to fall within any of the prohibited areas. That's now, if you start running out in the road and hand out cards, you know, we might, we might have a different issue, but, uh, but just standing there at those places holding up a sign, I don't think any of those places are going to fall in any of the prohibited areas. So we would not need a permit? No. So it's, I mean, and I nor, would, nor would you be passively soliciting because you're... You're, 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 well, you are passively soliciting, but you are passively soliciting in an area that's okay. Then what is political solicitation? You, you, it's you're still soliciting, but you're in an area that you can. Well, you're soliciting for political purposes, but you're still in an area that you can. I think we need to include the commissioner. <laughs> uh, what section has to do with the guy sitting outside of Kroger's? Uh, I'm getting confused, panhandling versus other handling or whatever, that is begging for money when I come out. Or uh, the guy that's over at the Minute Mart lot, when I come out or go in, is asking for money. What is that and where is that in here? I still think that is probably uh, a panhandling or soliciting, uh, although I will tell you most of my concern dealt with public property because private property owner rights, because I'm, I'm not sure I want a police officer to go into Kroger, for example, and, and say to somebody that they have given an okay to, you know, these private property owners have a lot of ability and a lot of rights. You know, more rights than we have on public property. They've got, they've got every right at Kroger or at Minimart to go out and tell that person, leave. Uh, you do not have our permission uh, to do this and, and you need to leave. Um, so, in reality, Commissioner, I would hope that most, if that's an issue, that most of private property owners deal with that. But at the same time, though, a private property owner has the ability to say to somebody, sure, if you want to stand in front of my store um, and ask, uh, you know, sell candy bars or, or cookies, um, that, that you can do that. So, but again, I think most of my concern has been with public property. You know, the sidewalks, the parks, and everything else, with the idea that private property owners all be dealing with their own issues on private property. Um, but again, on, on back to the permit, uh, I didn't put a fee in. I did ask that a photo be taken. Uh, I did ask they give their true name, provide ID if they've got it. If they don't have an ID, just give us a certified statement that they don't have an ID, because a lot of people don't have IDs. Um, I did ask for an address. Um, I had a question about that, and, and my response was that, well, we do have revocation language in here, that if, if somebody doesn't comply with this and they get cited, then we've got the ability to revoke that permit. Um, and if I revoke a permit by due process, I've got to give them notice. Because um, I'm going to be in probably some trouble in, in somewhere in a court if we revoke them. They didn't know anything about it. I didn't give them notice. Now they're going to be arguing that I didn't have due process rights because you didn't notify me, you didn't tell me. I can't notify them, I can't tell them about an address. Now, it doesn't have to be the address they live, you know, they live, just, you know, an address of a, a sibling, a parent, just somebody that we can get mailed to them if we ever have to give them some kind of a notice, okay? 
if they don't produce an address, they cannot get a permit. This is a requirement here right now they have to give us an address. Because I am concerned if I don't have an address, then, then my uh, revocation ability is now gone because I can't give them any kind of notice. Now, I think most people still should be able to give me maybe some address that they can get some kind of mail to from somewhere, at least I would uh, hope. But I know some people that may not happen. And you still use general delivery? So they could pick up their mail at the post office. Yes. I mean, and, um, you know, hopefully everybody's got somebody that they can, you know, they get some kind of, uh, uh, you know, information from, but, you know, still got a sibling somewhere that they can use their address or something. But, but my major concern was just a due process issue. Okay. I appreciate that. All right. And I think that's, um, again, I put in here the permit's going to be good for two years. The police chief's got the ability to revoke. Um, and if they do revoke, the made an appeal can be made to the city manager's office. So, and we've set out some of the language there. But that's pretty much it. I try to make this thing as simple I thought as we could. Uh, again, probably 80 to 85% of this came from the model ordinance uh, from IMLA. Um, you know, I guess if I always ask, you know, well, you know, what's, you know, is this thing going to stand challenge, I guess? Yeah, you know, I, I feel as good about this one, probably as most. Uh, as most out there this is such a an area in flux um, right you know right now with uh, with courts uh, about what the first amendment rights and what they are uh, but i feel pretty comfortable and confident i think about uh, about what we put in here but again anything that you've got issues with uh, i'll look at the one issue about expanding uh, the roads to pick up some of the shoulders uh, and and some of that area as well too um, and if you all want to, I can remove the five days and just make it, everybody's got to get a permit. I just did that just to, you know, because you, I think we all know if somebody truly is here for one day, they're not going to get a permit. Um, and we, I try to focus on those that are maybe more in the business of soliciting than, uh, than, than maybe truly needy. But, Although, but, I, but if you're okay with that, I'll remove the five days as well. Those that are, are here and truly needy on one day issue, the officer is going to take time to try to help find them some assistance to get them where they need to be anyway and that'd be the end of it uh any other questions or comments comments or qu hope it works all right i guess well done thank you gene well, i'll make those couple of changes and we'll get on the agenda thank you guys so the next question will be will it be on the next agenda for first reading january 2nd we can put on the next one i just got a couple of changes to make and as soon as i make those changes i'll run it by everybody to look at That'll be the question that I'm asked. So we'll, we'll move on from there. Thank you all. In the work session, we have a public comment section. If anybody has an item or issue they want to bring to the commission's attention, this will be their time for that. Your name and address, please, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Jeremy McFarland. My address is 198 Old Porter Pike here in Bowling Green. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to express my appreciation for Commissioner Denning and Nash for their concern regarding the concealed carry uh, ordinance in city buildings. And I also want to say that I appreciate Commissioner Denning's concern about diversity in our local workforce. Uh, passing a fairness ordinance would encourage additional diversity as well as attract more skilled people to our community. Uh, fairness is good for business. My greatest hope for 2018 is that we can further discuss and eventually pass the fairness ordinance. Uh, thank you all for your hard work this year, but especially to Commissioner Nash for all of his efforts towards making Bowling Green a more fair and welcoming community. Uh, happy holidays. Thank you. Other individuals? Hearing none, we'll close the meeting and we'll have a special call meeting tomorrow at 3.30 uh, just for the single item of uh, annexing that property. Uh, we won't be broadcasting that. It's just a second reading of that uh, annexation. And then our next regular meeting is Tuesday, January 2nd, 2018. I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you all very much. Same to you, Mayor. Yes, sir.